I am Joe Pine, but that's not important now. What's important is uh, for you to hear Andrew Grill, uh, who uh, is a leading thinker in the world on mobile technology. Uh, he lives, breathes, and eats mobile technology. And just in a short conversation with him, you're gonna see the passion that he has for this uh, come through in everything he says and everything he uh, thinks about. He's just, in fact, starting a book on Twitter, but it's Twitter for non-dummies, uh, on how you can really use it in, uh, in business. Uh, I found out he's an Australian from London, but he's been in the Netherlands now for uh, two times in the last uh, three weeks. And, uh, and I describe him as an as amateur anthropologist. He believes in actually asking people what they think and what they do. Uh, you know, that's right, it's an amazing concept in, in marketing, but I see so little of it actually going on. Uh, he is a marketer by background, although we discovered we both have technology degrees. Uh, and he's been a general manager, he's been a practitioner, and now he is a marketing consultant that helps companies around the world uh, embrace mobile technologies and use them in your business. So I suggest that you go to andrewgrill.com, you find his mobile number, and then you call him uh, and see how he can help you in your business. But first, let's hear him speak. Andrew. <laughs> Well, thanks, Joe, and thanks for the, the ad. It's great to, um, to have someone else advertising you. So I'm the guy with a funny voice for the next 30 minutes. Yes, I'm Australian, and unfortunately, when they said that uh, we'd be speaking in English for all six speakers today, I said, oh, dear, I only speak Australian. So you'll have to put up with my accent for the next 30 minutes. Um, as Joe said, I'm absolutely passionate about mobile. I've had one of these things the last 15 or 16 years. I was one of the first people in my group of friends to have one, and it attracted a lot of attention. And if you said to me that 20 years ago, you would have to carry this piece of plastic around with you everywhere and people would contact you on it, how foreign a concept. But I guarantee you, probably every single person in this room has a mobile with them. And so when we talk about mobile and advertising, it's kind of a foreign concept because to me, advertising is interruption. And so if we're on our mobile, which is very personal, and we decide to interrupt it, that kind of defeats the whole purpose. And so, this cartoon from Hugh McLeod makes a lot of sense. I'll let you read it. If you talk to people the way advertising talk to people, they'd punch you in the face. We have lived and breathed a broadcast mentality where people throw things at us and they say, you should do this, you should do that. There are things on here you should look at. And from our previous two speakers, the two things I thought uh, stuck out for me from Alan was that people need brands and brands need people. And I love from Jemay the concept of the bozo filter that I can screen out things I don't want. Because I think, ladies and gentlemen, consumers have started to get really smart. They've realized that they can actually start to say no. They can actually complain about things online. I'll give you an example. Yesterday, my cab ride from home to, um, to the train station uh, said on the cab, I take credit card. So I gave the cab driver my credit card, more than happy to pay cash, and he gave me five excuses why I couldn't use my credit card. And if you go to tr.im slash badcab, B-A-D-C-A-B, as I promised him, his photograph is now on the internet. I took a photo as he was doing, I said, in half a minute, your photo will be on the internet. And there are the five reasons why he upset me. Now, five or six years ago, if you had a problem with something, you would write a letter to the editor or you would ring someone up with the hope that you'd be published. But in, in five or six minutes from him annoying me, the world and my Twitter stream and, and my Flickr page, everyone knows I had a bad experience. Now, ironically, the cab company, who was named six times in my explanation, has not contacted me. I've heard nothing. In this new world, consumers have control. But the problem is, advertisers don't want to see that control because of what they've been doing. But ladies and gentlemen, this time it's personal. Let's try an example, let's try an experiment. Can everyone get their mobiles out, please? This is a mobile thing, there's a new sign outside that says, please turn your mobile on. Everyone get it out. Now I want you to give your mobile to the person on your right. And those at the end of the row that don't have someone on their right, uh, you miss out or you can give it to the person in front of you. Okay, so you've done that, everyone's got their mobile. Now, can you just look at what's on the front screen? What have they personalised there? What's on the front screen? And now can you go into the contact book and look up the first person there? Ah, uh, I thought so, I thought so. Very, very uncomfortable. No one likes to peer into our personal lives. So ladies and gentlemen, you can stop now. Give the phones back, go on, give them back. I don't want to, I don't want to know what's going on. It should be Twitter, it should be saying good things about me. Okay, phones back. The point is, the point is this piece of plastic 
is so personal that you don't want to give it to the person next to you for fear of what they might find. And I guarantee there's probably not a lot of secret stuff to find, but you feel very uncomfortable. So this thing has become so personal, so why are we allowing advertisers to market to us in the old traditional way? It doesn't work. And so in the next half an hour or 27 minutes, I hope to give you some examples of people doing it right. I'm going to tell you some secrets about the industry that people won't tell you and bust some myths. And I'm going to make it real because I have actually spoken, not to technologists, because I do that all the time in a room like this, and we all agree with each other. I've gone out there and spoken to the people with the money, the brands, the brand manager in Geneva responsible for oral health care for a well-known brand. What's keeping him awake at night is whether he gets his bonus because he's able to maintain the price premium on his toothbrush. I didn't mention technology there once. I didn't mention mobile there once. He doesn't care how we do it. I have to maintain my price premium. The problem in this industry, and what I love about it, what I hate about it, we all agree with each other. It's a fantastic opportunity going mobile. But when you talk to the people that are on the ground, at the coalface, with the cash to spend, they're very confused because they hear blah, 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 CPM, cut through. Uh, I just want to shift product. OK. Life's for sharing, and we've just done that by sharing mobiles with each other, and, and we don't want to share, even though you know, we're taught to share as children. A few sound bites for you to take away. 91% of us have the device within arm's reach 24-7, and I'm one of them. It woke me up this morning. I don't wear a watch anymore. This is my clock, my music, my camera. It is everything. It is my barcode. If you want to find me, ring this number, and you will find me anywhere in the world. 63% of Americans won't share their mobile, and in different markets it gets higher, and I think today we saw that it's a bit uncomfortable to share a mobile with someone. It takes an average of 26 hours to report a lost wallet, but only 68 minutes for a lost phone. I know that myself, because in Barcelona, I put my phone in my jacket pocket, and for that split second, I thought, I've lost my mobile in Barcelona. And racing through my head was, how do I block my email? How do I do all that? But if I'd lost my wallet, an inconvenience, but I would have rung the bank and got another one. Getting another one of these is really painful because of the way we've personalised it. OK, time for the iPhone statistic or reference. Everyone has to have one. I don't have one today. Um, but I have a personal story. I have resisted getting an iPhone until recently. In fact, this is an iPod Touch. It is not an iPhone. I felt left out. Everyone was talking about iPhone this and iPhone that. I thought, I've got to get one to, to see what I'm missing out on. I'm addicted. It is a great user experience. Don't like the keyboard, but it is a great user experience. And my three-year-old daughter, Madeline, hi if you're watching, darling, she now uses this as if she was born with it. So a three-year-old little girl just intuitively uses it. And, and interestingly, she went back to my Nokia and wanted to touch the screen, because that's the way she does things. So it is really easy to use. And I think the iPhone is actually a euphemism, another word for how phones should be. In three or four years' time, this will be at version 5. And this will still be version 2. But I think the iPhone is what everyone wants phones to be. They just work. The payments work. It's a great experience. And the other companies will get there. But I think why the iPhone is talked about in every single presentation is because it really is a good experience. And I'll give you some examples of what I found. So what does your mobile say about you? This is a screenshot of the front screen of this. Whoops, wrong one. Too many mobiles. Of this. What does it say about me? Well, clearly, I haven't read my RSS feeds lately because I've got 2,229 unread. But what does that say is I'm getting my information from somewhere else. I'm using Twitter, as many people do. A Andrew Gould is my Twitter name. Because Twitter is hand-picked information from people I care about and people I respect. And so I've actually gone away from reading RSS feeds because I generally read about it in real time on Twitter, go back there, and actually find that I've already seen it. Uh, I haven't read my Facebook things. I don't really use Facebook. I don't get it. Uh, I can watch TV. What else have I got? Obviously, I travel a lot. There are some travel apps and those sort of things. But what that front screen says is this is how I've personalised it. I've actually taken time to make that my own. And as you saw when you looked at someone else's phone, they've personalised it their own way. So it means something about us. It really does mean um, this is mine. Who's watched the Mad Men series? Great thing on, um, it was AMC in the US and it's been on BBC4. If you can get it online or go and buy it at the shops, it is a brilliant series about advertising uh, back in the 60s. But it reminds me very much of how we're stuck in the 60s, that the whole reach and frequency and television is king seems to dominate all the conversations I have. 
And everyone goes, mobile's great, but we're still doing stuff on TV. So we need to change the approach. We need to stop broadcasting and telling people, and we need to give people a choice, especially on a device so personal as the mobile, because it just doesn't go. Now, this is something that really, really annoyed me. Two days ago, everyone heard of Britain's Got Talent? If you've been under a rock, you probably haven't heard about it. This was on Thursday night. I took a screenshot because I saw it. I was so incensed. Now, imagine this is going live to air. It's about a 60 second. They talk about uh, text in A, B, or C to this number or do this. Now, you look at the, um, the terms and conditions, and I'll zoom in on it. I read this and got really upset. To decline marketing text, send, sorry, end SMS with no info. So if you actually read all of that in time and you remembered to put no info at the end, you won't get junk. This is a broadcaster inflicting the broadcast mentality onto mobile, and it's wrong. Because they don't have permission to do that. Now, they'll say, if they send me a marketing text, that I consented to it, but all I sent them was A, B, or C. They know nothing about me. They don't want to know anything about me. They want to have the ability to have lots of numbers to send stuff back to me, and that is wrong. But that works, thank you very much. That works in the old world when you buy TV and you want lots of eyeballs, but mobile's not about lots of eyeballs. About, it's about cost per relevant audience. It's about what Alan said. Small is beautiful in mobile. The advertising world has to change. I again found this cartoon. It's a little hard to read, so I'll read it out. Um, in April 2008, we were saying, we buy all of our ingredients from one of Bolivia's most sustainable cooperatives, ensuring they get a fair price and you get peace of mind. Our vision, one world free from commercial exploitation. Fast forward to April 2009, buy one, get one free. <laughs> the world has to change because we are saying we're sick of hearing all this junk, we want the control. Okay, Piccadilly Circus, lots of advertising, very, very busy, very old world, looks fantastic, costs a mint. New world is a small screen. You can see at the top we have a banner ad and I clicked on it and I didn't go back. It was pretty completely useless, completely irrelevant and actually detracted from my experience of finding out the weather. But we're there today because the internet, the thing that we said would never work in 2000, nine years later is now working. And so with every old technology, we try and put the new one, uh, use what we used before on the, on the new one, and it doesn't always work. Now, I need to set some credentials here um, because I have actually run the world's most successful mobile advertising campaign. And that may sound very arrogant, but let me explain. It was exactly five years ago today, 1st of June 2004, Sydney. I proposed to my wife. And she said, I want something different. Okay, fireworks, sky riding, what am I going to do? So I actually contacted the company that rides these scooters around Sydney. And I then contacted them and said, I want to use you to propose to my wife to run a mobile advertising campaign. So I got three posters made. One said um, Mary, one said me, one said Samantha with our photos and had them drive around Sydney where I knew she'd be. There they are in Sydney. <laughs> now, the thing was, the guys actually said, are you sure you want to do this? We don't actually offer a money back guarantee. <laughs> I'm happy to say five years later, she said yes, the guy got the girl. So um, thank you. I digress, that's not really a mobile campaign, but it's, it's kind of cute. <laughs> but what about if advertising was personal? In fact, this is a real photograph taken in a lift in the London Underground. CBS Outdoor are very, very uh, forward thinking. They run these digital electronic panels on escalators. And I saw this before Christmas, and I don't know whether Joe is real, but they've run things before. But it's a bit, a bit like the future. You know, hey, Joe, I uh, didn't get the beer in, let's catch up. So we're now looking at how we make this personal. And if I'm, my name was Joe, I would have looked at that. It's not, so I sort of looked, I still took a picture though, but that's where we need to get to so that things become relevant and interesting and we then say, we're gonna take the Bozo filter off and we're gonna look at that because it means something to me and I'm allowing that through to my personal device. Let's go back to 1941 in America. This was the very first television ad ever. And imagine the scene, it's a 30 second TV commercial and all that happens is a voiceover says, America runs on Bolivar time. That's all it said. Because back in 1941, they knew how to do radio. And this thing called television came along and they were absolutely confounded as to how to make it work. Now, 10 years on, they worked out that moving pictures could sell. So fast forward to 2002, 2003, 2004, the mobile comes along, we'll just do the same thing from the internet and it doesn't work. 
So the internet on the mobile is not the answer. And in fact, this is, an, again, a real ad that was served to my phone. Hot babes free on your E71. Not relevant, not wanted. I'm actually offended by that, but they thought it was okay to serve it to me. So this is wrong. This is wrong because it's just not the way forward. And people are going to say, this is not what I want on my mobile. This is rubbish. This is spam. It's a fail. So let's, let's talk happy. We've talked doom and gloom. Let's talk about what's happening next. And uh, some really smart stuff is happening in the branding world where brands are saying, get my brand on the mobile so people can experience uh, the brand while it's in my hand. And there's a great example here from Guinness. They did something for the Hong Kong 7 Rugby where there's a Mandarin translator and you could find things. There's the iPint, you're probably familiar with, where you tip the iPhone and the, the, the glass of beer pops up. And something simple is useful, uh, like the BA um, check-in you can do on your mobile. So that's a brand on your mobile. It's probably the first, well, the, the first and last one, yes, you'd say they're useful. The middle one's a bit of fun. But these branded applications are popping up. So a few I've found recently in the iStore are um, a spirit level. So I can actually use my iPhone to measure the, the level of my piece of wood if I wanted to do that. Um, there's a really smart one from Inside Mobile um, about Reebok, and you can actually design a Reebok shoe on your iPhone. Zippo have a, a lighter, which is completely useless, but a bit of fun. I've talked about it, I've told 400 people, and Zippo are happy that their brand was mentioned. And there's even one from Gillette, where you can actually draw a beard on you, my daughter loves this, doing it to herself, and then shave the beard off. And it's what you might look like if you grew a beard. Now, it's a bit of fun. Again, I've played with it a few times, clearly at least once. Um, I don't want to grow a beard, but again, Gillette got mentioned. Am I going to, if I was to buy a shaver, mention to the person behind the desk I played with this to buy the shaver? Probably not. So the conversion from playing with the app through to actually knowing if I bought something still isn't there. You know, there's some great branders' experiences. This one at the top from BMW is completely addictive. It's for the new Z4. And it mirrors their television campaign where they literally got a basketball-sized canvas, paper or strong, strong uh, paper or something, and got a Z4 to drive around spraying paint onto its wheels. And you can imagine as they spin around, you, you do things. And you can have this experience on the iPhone, and it's addictive. I've done it several times. Am I in the market for a BMW Z4 right now? No. If I bought one, would I tell the dealer I'd played with this? No. And even if I did, would he tell the marketing manager? Probably not. So you're never going to get the cut through from, I played with your brand and I bought the car. So you need some measurability. In-game advertising, again, Coke are plastered all over this uh, baseball game. And this one here called Keep Me, Keep Me Up King. It's, again, kind of addictive. But the shirt and the background can all be branded to a football team or a footwear manufacturer so they can get their brand in the hand of the user. It doesn't really feel like advertising because it's not sort of confronting. It's kind of in the background. Uh, stuff that the guys at Gigaphone do, idle screen. You know, when the phone is ringing, you've got some dead time and you can serve an ad, but importantly, the ad is served based on some preferences. So here we're getting the, the concept of asking people what they're interested in. Uh, Mark, are you in the audience? Mark, what's your favourite colour? Periwinkle. Periwinkle. There's a word I've never heard before today. Who else has heard of periwinkle? A few people. You've got some periwinkle fans. You should join a social network on periwinkle lovers. <laughs> My point is that I asked Mark his favourite colour and he told me, he knew the context I was asking him. And I think as advertisers and mobile operators, we're scared of asking people for what they might tell us. And you can imply, you can imply that I have a certain phone and using it at a certain time of day and what I'm doing, but implication leads to confusion. And so, you know, by asking people implicitly, we would like to send you something about our brand, tell us about what you like and we'll send you stuff we like. The problem is, though, let's say in a perfect world we can do that, the marketers still say, wow, I've got a million phone numbers. Let's send lots of messages. We've got to get it right so that marketers don't abuse the trust that we put in them. Another interesting thing, uh, GeoVector and other guys at Sparks are doing similar things. Instead of what's in your area, use the compass in the G1 or the N97 or the iPhone version 3 to narrow down things in the area. So literally you're pointing at something like the Eiffel Tower and it says, that's the Eiffel Tower. We talk about augmented reality. So those sorts of things are coming. But clearly with limited phones, it's going to take a while. But brands love this. Um, you know, so you use the world as your world mouse. But what I encourage brands to do is, yes, it's, it's great to do that stuff. It looks fantastic. Great PR. You might win some awards. But when I talk to the coalface, as I was in Dublin last week, or if I'm in Switzerland or somewhere, where I'm talking to a brand manager who has no experience with mobile, they just want to sell stuff. And their KPIs and their bonus is based on selling more stuff. So literally, um, you know, here's an example of, 
backtrack a bit. Airlines like BMI are using this. So when I flew to Dublin on BMI, they sent me my ticket as a barcode. And I thought, OK, I'm going to try this. I want to see the experience. So I'm actually, I had the boarding pass in my back pocket in case it didn't work. And at Heathrow Terminal 1, check in through immigration, check, it scanned. Boarding gate, check, it scanned. And I showed the thing to the lady on the aircraft and I walked on. Bingo. So airlines, and in fact Heathrow Express, the train does the same thing. You've now got big organisations like Lufthansa and BMI that are telling people it's OK to do this. Very small numbers using it, but it now seeds the market. Uh, and you can see it in retail. But the point I'm making is we've now got to move from really cute branded stuff to things where we can measure what we've done. Because this brand manager in Dublin works for a large retail organisation. They've noticed that fewer people are visiting their stores. And they've actually got a task force on it. And so they've said, could we use mobile to literally say to people, send offer to a short code, uh, a text number, and get back a message saying, a year off your coffee, take it to the shop, show the shopkeeper and get your year off, and then they, even on a piece of paper, say, oh, we had 15 mobile people today. They want to see ROI. Big brands have said to me, Andrew, we believe in mobile, but you've got to give us the ammunition so we can go back to our marketing people who love TV and prove this works. So we've got to move from cute branded stuff to things that actually work. So let's talk about some mobile secrets. Shh, don't tell anyone, live stream, look away. Mobile operators don't have the information brands want. That is a very um, controversial statement, but at the moment it's true, but there's an opportunity. Because mobile operators are in this world and brands are in this world and they don't talk the same language. I know because I'm in the middle translating between brands who talk reach and frequency and propensity to buy and all those sort of things, and mobile operators that talk a different set of language. So for example, your prepaid customer base, are they male or female? To a brand wanting to advertise shavers or uh, female hygiene products, it's fairly important to know the gender of your audience. But if we don't know without asking, then we're never going to get it right. When I was in Amsterdam three weeks ago, we had the CRM manager of VW uh, gave a brilliant presentation. This is a person that really loves mobile. And we asked what the mobile budget was, and he said it was zero. In fact, they only spend 1% of the digital budget on mobile. 1% of digital on mobile. He can't get the TV guys or the guys who like TV to agree to spend more. They say it actually takes eight touches of the brand before they get a test drive. And these guys know that one of them was through mobile, and of course the TV guys say, oh, the other seven were ours. It's a hard slog even inside companies like Volkswagen. Mobile secret number two. No one ever got sacked for buying TV. That's the problem. These big TV ads, now let's look at a, a big TV ad from, uh, from days gone by. Uh, this is actually now 20 years old. And we have our first on-stage fail. Fantastic. What you would have seen is the, is the iconic British Airways campaign called World Face. Everyone remember it? The, the Malcolm McLaren track and all that sort of stuff. We'll see if we can get it going in the background. Yeah, but we'll, well, that's a sort of really big ad that costs millions and millions of euros and everyone remembers it. But you can't have that experience on a mobile. And I think the times of the big ad are gone. But unfortunately, people still say, you know, television is king. Any luck? Yeah. Oh, here we go. There we go, the first fail on stage down to me. I always get the fails. So we'll go back to the presentation. You can imagine, come and see me afterwards and I'll show you. It's on YouTube. In fact, go to tr.im slash ba1989 and you'll see it. Everything's got a short code. Coming up, worth waiting for maybe? Four, three, two, one. <laughs> Let's go back to the slides. Let's go back to the story. You know what the BA campaign looks like. Mobile secret number three, and this is a quote, I can't tell you who or I'll expose them, but they're a bit scared that mobile might actually show up TV. How do you measure TV? It's a diary system. You either have someone write down what they're doing, what they're watching, or what they're exposed to, or you look at what their channel was tuned to. The problem being is it's not perfect. So the people in brand and agency land are a bit scared that when we get mobile right, it'll be so measurable the clients are going to say, this TV stuff, you've been making me spend billions of pounds, euros on all this media, and it hasn't really worked. Joe will talk in a minute about the concept of the multiverse, which is really, really mind-blowing, and I'm really looking forward to it. But let me just anchor it with a, with a thought that this thing can be your remote control. Now, it may be that the content or the information is not delivered 
onto the device, it might be delivered to a channel or a place that you look at, normally like the television, let's say. But because it knows where you are, which way you're facing, all those sorts of things, and it's about you, it can be used to help direct where you find content from. So I might ask Joe about that in his presentation. And it's a subtle way, for example, of learning a bit more about you. This is actually an iPhone uh, TV guide. And so I can look at what TV programs are on, and if I have a Sky Plus box or a TV, I can record it. Now, TV and music is very, very personal. And so if I allow someone to learn about what I'm interested in and then allow me to choose to have content served to me that's relevant, it might be ways like looking at your TV viewing that actually assist that without having to ask you out front. Number four, this is another real quote from a big brand. We're not interested in CPM or click-through. We just want to sell stuff. And David Ogilvy, who is the king of advertising, king of Madison Avenue, said, advertising must sell or else. Awards are nice, but product increased sales are even better and keep the shareholders happy. Small is beautiful. This is what I'm talking about, that you have reach and frequency where you reach millions and millions of people. If you go onto mobile and make it relevant, you then reduce your reach to something that is relevant. And that is a very hard concept for brand managers to get around. And I was saying to this person in Ireland about why we haven't seen lots and lots of case studies. I think it's because the numbers are so small, no brand manager wants to release that they had 5,000 people access the mobile site. But what about if of those 5,000, 2,500 wanted your product and they bought it? This is where mobile will win over, but it's very hard to convince people you know, when they're talking small numbers. So reach and frequency, Squeeze into relevancy is a really tough sell at the moment. That's something I'm talking a lot about, but it's going to take a lot of banging and a lot of drums to have people agree that small can actually be quite beautiful. I think this is my last secret. Unless we hear the three Ps of mark, uh, mobile advertising, which I'll show you in a moment, we are all doomed. It is not going to work. And they are permission, privacy, and preference. People will decide who can advertise to them. People will decide what you do with their information, unlike the ITV people that basically said, once we've got it, it's ours. And people will decide what preference they have. We want control back to do that, and we will do it through the mobile. But we have to convince brands that by doing this, it actually makes sense for them. Inference and assumption has a limited lifespan. So I'm going to get it radical. I think we should give mobile advertising a brand new name. I'll give you a quick aside. Um, my wife, if you're watching Darling High, um, she, about three months ago, was on Google doing a search for antique furniture. And she said to me, Google doesn't have ads. Now, exactly. We all know it does. But to her, there were no ads because it was completely irrelevant. Now, we know that every single one of them, someone works very hard. But that is the point. And my wife is the ultimate anti-ad person. She doesn't like ads. So for her to say, I'm just seeing what I want in front of me, it's relevant, she is our target market. And if we can make information relevant, and maybe we talk about sponsorship, because I don't mind if something is sponsored by and then they leave me alone. So maybe we talk about sponsored information. It's not advertising that interrupts you. It's something that, yes, there's a benefit in there, but it's information that's relevant. And I think if we get that right, mobile will absolutely be the winner in this. Thank you very much. <laughs>
But, but, it, but, it's, but it's not as if advertisers could fully measure everything that they're doing today. That's what always gets me about that, yeah. you know, that, that roadblock they put up yeah. because they can't, they can't measure the success of their, of their campaigns today, at least not fully. And that's the thing. They think it's good enough to right. get the next budget. That's the thing. So right. if we prove that mobile is 10 times more measurable than TV, you can't ignore the facts. In this environment, if right. you present that case to a brand manager or brand director, they will say, we'll give it a go. We'll up the spend. So I would think you know, next year we'll be talking about 100 or 200,000 campaigns rather than 50,000 campaigns. Right. So, so who is doing it well now? Well, you know, the, the companies, like I say, have got lots of branding going on, but I really haven't seen a lot of really good conversion ones because, as I say, people don't like talking about the numbers, and so they're kind of obfuscated. Um, but I think big F FMCG companies like Coca-Cola have been doing this for a while. They get mobile and they understand it. But I think as an industry, we need to move them further to show them how they can convert and measure it and do things that are exciting. And all the things we've heard about today, augmented reality and those sort of things, start trying some of these things. They are in the future for some of us, but for other people, they're right on the doorstep. Okay. Right. Well, one more quick question, then we'll turn it over to, uh, to the audience. You, you told me earlier that you're going to write this book on, on uh, you said it wasn't going to be Twitters for dummies, so I said it was basically <laughs> Twitters for non-dummies, right? Yeah. Twitters for smarties. So what's the, what's the number one message that you think uh, is there about how to use Twitter to actually make a difference in your business? Well, right now on Twitter, you can search for hash MoMAMS, and you can see what's happening in this room. The other day, I was in front of a brand manager, and I said to her, um, let's see what's people are talking about your brand at the moment. And she was horrified that there was stuff there that she didn't know about. So I think the number one thing is, it is a instant health check for what people are saying about you. And just as the Comcad people I got upset with uh, on, uh, on Sunday about the bad experience, uh, a lot of people would have read about that, but they don't, they don't care. They don't right. care people are, are talking in a negative way about the brand. It's a brand health check and it's free. Right, you gotta care. Yeah. Okay, thanks to both of you. Um, there are some questions coming in, but uh, Yuri first has a qu quick question. <laughs> quick one, yeah. Okay. Uh, surprise, surprise. Yeah, I'll keep it short. Uh, first, we had TV, no, then online with inter interactivity. So we got from CPM towards CPC, CPL, CPS, CPA, blah, blah, blah. And now we go from online to mobile. So my question is, taking into account Marshall McLuhan, the USPs of a specific unique medium, taking into account the uniqueness of mobile, location-based. Yep, yep. What new business models will arrive due to the specific nature of mobile? Is that, for example, to teach you a little, uh, cost per RFID uh, sensed, sens uh, sensed, or cost, cost per barcode sensed, or do you see all other different re revenue models uh, emerge? Thanks. I'll turn the question around. Because we're, <laughs> because we're talking in terms that we understand. So that question has no value at all to a brand manager. CPC, CPR, CP, CPX, they don't care about. They care about product. They care about increasing. There's a brand manager cares about brand health, and there's a product manager that cares about increasing it. So I'm actually not going to answer that question because I don't want us to keep talking about these stupid CX things. I want us to talk about helping customers fulfill their business objectives. What is their pain point, and how can mobile as a channel solve that? So I'm, I'm actually going to refuse to answer CPX questions because they are what we talk about. They are not what the real world talks about. And the ones with the money, they want to hear a language they understand. So let's talk their language. One thing that people keep saying, thank you, is that brands don't come to conferences like this. How many here are from a brand or an agency? One, not a lot. That's a holiday today. And I guarantee if, if it was a four-day conference and it was in London, travel bans, you would not, not be able to come possibly. So what have I been doing? I've been going into agencies and into brands, an hour of their time at lunchtime, put some lunch on and 14 people turn up. So take the message to them in their environment and then the whole team hears about it. So we did a thing in London with the Mobile Marketing Association. We had BA and, 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 and Rory there, it was an evening thing. The table in front of me, it was standing room only, I was standing in front of the BA table, British Airways. And you had some fairly young marketers there who were listening to a message that they would not have heard if, if their manager had gone to the conference. Which means, think about social networks, they talk about it, and the next day at the office they would all be talking about this great stuff. And that's where ideas form. So if you can go into a company, into a brand, and inject the enthusiasm and the, and the tools, they will then work it out themselves. Send one person as a rep, and then they go back, you haven't got the synergy of the team. So go in, in go embedded. And if anyone would like me to come in and talk to them, I'm more than happy. Ah, good words. Um, um, so, sorry, two questions? Okay, I have just two Twitter, Twitter questions, so sorry for the rest of the audience. Uh, Dirk Grote, Dirk, where are you? 
down in the back. Um, small is beautiful, but are they, uh, their figures showing that it earns you more than a small percentage of large numbers? Or to put it another way, 50% of 5,000 is still less than 1% of 1 million. Okay, again, turn it on its head. What about if I told you that everyone sitting in this part of the room right now wanted your product? And they put their hand up and said, I want it today. What would you pay for that information? Would you pay 10 euros, 100 euros, 200 euros? I've heard figures in terms of 80 or 90 euros for an insurance company knowing that today people want to buy insurance. So yes, percentages of percentages is small, but can you tell me with a big TV campaign how many people actually bought the product versus people saying, I want your product now, please send it to me. That is the hump we have to get over, that yes, the numbers are small, but think about it in terms of return and people that have identified I'm a brand advocate and I love and want your product right now. That is the power of mobile. Cool. Um, um, Monique de Haas, also known as Dondersteen, has a quick question. How would you define or measure relevance? Mm, well, Alan Moore is the expert here, cost per relevant audience. I mean, he can have a whole workshop on this. It's relevant because it means something to me. So either, like you saw on the checkboxes from Gigaphone, we actually say, I'm male, I'm 40, I live in London, I like technology. So if you send me something in that sphere, I will, I will think it's relevant. But just on that, I think there are, just quickly, there are two phases. First of all, you have to incent customers to fill the forms in. So you dangle the carrot, you give them free stuff. And then marketing managers get smart and they say, right, I've got a small number of people who have absolutely identified what they want and I'll send it to them. And each time I have a touch, it's more and more relevant. And so they get the cognitive juices flowing and they say, you know what, what's happening here, the experience I'm having is a fantastic experience. I'll keep doing it. So it's relevant when it means something to me. A bit like a great hotel, you keep going back. Why? Because you had a great experience and you want that experience again. Thank you very much. Thank you.